And good morning. Good morning. Welcome. This morning we're going to look at one verse out of the Gospel of John. It is so important, and I hope you can see by the end how important this is. Suppose someone asked you to name the, the greatest miracle that ever took place. What would be some of your... Jesus, okay. The resurrection, awesome. Pardon? Turning water into wine, all right. <laughs> Thank you, associate pastor. <laughs> Raising Lazarus from the dead. Yes. Yeah. Now, what we need to do then is, in order to understand miracles, we have to define it. Louis Burkhoff defines miracles as uh, his extraordinary providence in which God worked immediately or without the mediation of second causes in their ordinary operation. What? <laughs> that basically means it's in a way, God works in a way that is out of the ordinary to produce unexpected results. So things don't happen ordinarily. It's something that happens extraordinarily and it's God who does this work. So if you have any understanding of the Bible, I imagine as you just listed, there will be several more greatest miracles that you might share. Maybe the clothing, closing of the mouth of lions, demolishing the walls of Jericho. As you said, causing blind men to see, the blame to walk, parting the Red Sea. But for me, my personal understanding is this. The greatest miracle is the incarnation, where God became a man. Uh, Wayne Grudem says this, that the fact that the infinite, omnipotent, eternal Son of God become a man and join himself to humanity and human nature forever so that infinite God became one person with finite man will remain for eternity the most profound miracle and the most profound mystery in all of the universe. John Murray says the incarnation means that God who never began to be as God began to be what was eternally something that was not. For him too, it was the most amazing and incredible miracle that ever happened. And so this morning, we're going to look at John chapter 1, verse 14. And hear the words of John as he shares with us about this great miracle. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we observed his glory, the glory as the one and only son from the father, full of grace and truth. Now why would God do that? Why would he become a man? So we're going to explore this one verse this morning, and we're going to discover some truths as to why God did this. It is all about him. And it is he that we have come to worship. We are lifting him up. And as we lift him up, we are promised this, that he will draw all men unto himself. Not only here are we going to lift up Jesus, I, I want you to know that as he is being lifted up now, that he is drawing us to himself. Some, maybe for the first time. Maybe some of us have been lax and we've been drifting away. I'm confident that as we lift him up, what he's going to do is draw us to himself. Tonight, the same thing. As we gather in providence, There'll be a time where we're lifting up Jesus. The truth of, of who he is is going to be lifted up. And in that time, he's going to be drawing people to himself. And that is our prayer. It's been a lot of preparation that has been done to this point to celebrate tonight. We realize this, no matter what we've done, 
if it isn't the power and the presence of Christ doing it through us, then it has no eternal significance. So it's our prayer that all that's been done has been for his glory and for his will and his purpose. So would you join me in that prayer? Father, we do lift up the name of Jesus for the sole purpose of glorifying and honoring him. And your word tells us when that is done, all for his glory, you said that you would draw all men to yourself. So would you draw us this morning? I thank you for these songs. I thank you for this opportunity to lift the name of Jesus and to sing unto him, holy, holy, holy. Your majesty, we've come to worship. I ask the same thing that as we gather tonight, I thank you for all the hard work that has been done. I thank you for the way you've revealed yourself through all these efforts. And now, Father, we give this night to you that you would perform the miracle of coming and living within a human being. The lives would be transformed for eternity as a result of all this effort in tonight's celebration. We lift up the name of Jesus. Now speak to us. Then we, we may leave this place more confident in our relationship with you and one another. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Please be seated. So why would God do this? Why would he become one of his creatures? Why would the infinite become part of the finite and then remain? Not returning to his spiritual, but to actually have a glorified body and be seated at the right hand of the Father. Why would he do all of that? He loves us. I like that answer. He loves us. Well, I got some other answers too. Based on these verses, this verse, I want to share with you uh, three things. Number one, I want to share with you to reside with his creatures. He wanted to live with us. That's amazing. God wanted to live with us. Now you would think, why didn't God do this earlier? Why didn't he become a, a man earlier? Why did he take so long in, in, to come in the form of a man to redeem lost humanity? Well, first of all, I want you to know that it was necessary for God to prepare his creatures. They weren't ready for this. They needed some things done, and, and, and in God's wisdom, he made preparations. He wanted them to understand what this meant for him to come in the flesh to be like one of us. So we got them ready for this. And number one, uh, God resided with his creatures. But I want you to see, first of all, his picture. He wanted you to see something. He wanted us to see something. In the uh, Young's Living Translation, verse 14 is translated this way, and you'll see it on the screen. And the word became flesh and did tabernacle amongst us. Skenau is the Greek word that is used for dwelt in this passage. Many of your verses or your Bibles have, he dwelt with us. But the actual meaning is tabernacled with us. Now, not many of us use that word tabernacle for dwelling. For, for a Jewish mind, they would understand immediately what tabernacle meant. It meant being with them. And so this is the picture that he's given them. What would a tabernacle look like? Uh, in Exodus chapter 25, verses 8 through 9, in the Old Testament, they were instructed by God to build a tabernacle. And it was in that tabernacle that God would reveal himself. That's where he would reside with them. In verse 8, it says, They are to make a sanctuary for me so that I may dwell among them. I will tabernacle with them. You must make it according to all that I show you, the pattern of the tabernacle, as well as the pattern of all its furnishings. So here's a, a picture of a tabernacle. Now, I don't know how, if it looked that way. Dan, was that the way it looked? From what you... <laughs> pretty close, huh? 
the, the tabernacle had also the, the holy place, which the holy of holies resided. And also there's a part of preparation. The laver was here, and there was also the burnt, the altar of burnt offering. Now inside, there was also much more detail. The priest would here on a daily basis be sure to take care of this area. And this was the menorah. Uh, it's a, it refers to the presence of God. This is the presence or the showbread. And then also you had the altar of incense. And then beyond this curtain, what you and I often know about is the Holy of Holies. And this is the, the Ark of the Covenant where God would meet Moses and meet his people. And that's where he would reside with his people. So I hope you, you see, the, first of all, the picture of what it looks like. And you and I get to see from that picture something about Christ because Exodus chapter 8 verse 5 says that these served as a copy. It was a, an opportunity for them to see a picture of what was going to soon take place in the coming of God, his second person of Trinity, as a man. And so he says that this is a shadow of the heavenly things. As Moses was warned when he was about to complete the tabernacle, God said, be careful that you make everything, be careful you make everything according to the pattern that was shown to you on the mountain because I want my people to get a clear picture of what's coming. And you have got to be sure to take care of every detail. In chapter 9 of the book of Hebrews, verse 11, it says, but Christ has appeared as the high priest of the good things that have come in a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is, not of creation. So the tabernacle was a picture of what Christ, when he would come, what it would look like. And you can see the presence and a few other things that we're going to talk about here in, in a minute. And the first thing I want to share with you is this. Not only was it a, a, a picture, but number two, I want you to see the position. You see, this is something else that's going to show us about Jesus. Not only a tabernacle being with us gets us to understand the picture of what it, he is, but it also gives us the position. And I want you to see uh, in Numbers chapter 2, verse 17, the tent of meeting is to be moved out with the Levites camp, which is in the middle of the camps. They are to move out just as they camped, each in his place with their banners. So the Levites, in this picture again, the first one that I shared with you, this was their camp on the outside. I'm not sure if the tents look like that, but you get an idea of what it is. A tabernacle was also referred to these tents. The Levites surrounded the tabernacle as they camped, and they were right in the center of the entire camp. And so I want you to see that picture also, is that when Christ tabernacles with us, when God tabernacles with us, he wants to be in the center of everything. Our relationships, our vocations, whatever we do, he wants us to be right in the center. Exodus chapter 40, verses 1 and 2. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, you are to set up the tabernacle, the tent of meeting, the first day of the month, and to be sure you put it right in the middle. Number three, his perfection. I want you to see also his perfection in these verses. In uh, Exodus 25, verse 16, they were to put the tablets of the testimony that I will give you into the ark. Now, I showed you the ark was in the Holy of Holies. And inside the Holy of Holies, we know that they placed the, the, the tablets, the Ten Commandments. Now, one thing you know about the Ten Commandments, they reveal the holiness of God, his perfection. And they were right there in, in the midst of their, of, their, of their presence. In Exodus 25, 22, he said, I will meet you there above the mercy seat, the place that was on top of the ark. He said, I would meet you there, Moses, and between the two cherubim, there were one on each side of the ark, and the mercy seat was in the middle. As, and he said, I will speak with you from there about all that I commanded you regarding the Israelites. So he's basically telling him, I am going to tell you everything that I want you to do. These are my commands. These are not suggestions. These are what you are to do. Now one thing we know 
that each one of us have failed miserably in that manner. We all have sinned. We've broken God's commandments. And as a result, we've fallen short of his glory. But it tells us in Psalm 40, verse 8, a prophecy concerning the coming of God as a man. It says this about him, I delight to do your will. Your commands are not something that are a burden to me. What you've asked me to do is a delightful thing, my God, and your instruction is deep within me. You see, you and I, we hide God's word in our hearts so that we don't sin against him. And what he's asked us to do is not a burden, but it's a blessing. It's an honor. It reflects who we are as Christians. In John chapter 8, Jesus said this about himself in verse 29. The one who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone because I always, always do what pleases him. Now one thing you and I know is this. We do not always do what pleases God. Nevertheless, his requirements never change. Oh, but today we speak of relativism. We think of our own experiences. And so we discount these things. Like for instance, no longer does God want us to obey the Ten Commandments. We can simply obey six out of the ten. And no longer do we tithe 10%, we can do 5%. We make it relative. God's commands are still firm and still expected. And when God's people claim to be his, what do we do? We follow his commands. And when we fail, we're told to confess our sin and to repent, turning from it. Number four, I want you to see his person. When you see the tabernacle, I want you to see his person. In Exodus chapter 40, verse 33, it says, Now, next Moses set up the surrounding courtyard for the tabernacle and the altar and hung a screen for the gate of the courtyard so that Moses finished the work. And then the cloud covered the tent of meeting and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. He showed up. The God who created all things the God who needed no human hands to build him a home came and showed up in that place that he told Moses to build. And he was with them. Moses was unable to enter the tent of meeting because the cloud rested on it and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. When you hear the word that God became a man and tabernacled among us. I hope you see that picture of what it looks like. I hope you see his, his presence, his position. And number five, I hope you see his person. What do they do? We observed his glory. Verse 14 says, the glory of as the one and only son of the father. That's who showed up. Not a cloud, not a power, but a person. And in Hebrews chapter one, verse one says, long ago God spoke to the forefathers by the prophets at different times and in different ways. And in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. God has pointed him heir of all things and made the universe through him. The son is the radiance of God's glory. When you meet Jesus, guess who you meet? You meet God in all of his glory, in the exact expression of his nature, Sustaining all things by his powerful word. The next thing I want you to see is his propitiation. His sacrifice, his payment for our sin. In order for the high priest to actually enter the holy of holies, he went through a process of cleansing, sacrifice, washing, all those things in order to then present himself into the very presence of God. Now, one thing you and I have at this confidence, in, Luke, in, Le, in, in Leviticus chapter 16, you can see the whole sacrificial uh, responsibility and laws that were required for someone to, to go through in order to experience the forgiveness and the cleansing from God. Then Hebrews chapter 1 verse 3 says this about Jesus. After making 
purification for sins, our sins. He became the sacrifice. He became the means by which you and I can understand and receive God's forgiveness. He laid himself on the altar. He died as that lamb of God to take away the sins of the world. That's what he did for us. He is our propitiation. So when you see the tabernacle, please see the altar. And please see the son of God who became a man, died for you and me. In 1 John chapter 2, verse 2, he says, He himself is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the whole world. Oh, I hope that is heard on tonight when we gather, that those people understand that the God, holy, majestic, glorified, honored, and worshiped, came as a man and died for them. You want to talk about love. No greater love, Jesus said, has any man than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. Even John understood this when he saw Jesus. In John chapter 1, verse 29, when John was baptizing, it says, the next day John saw Jesus coming toward him, and he said, here is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world world. All of them. And number seven, I want you to see, lastly, about the tabernacle, is his praise. When they entered into the tabernacle, when they had that into the court where they could come and, and, and experience the, the power and the majesty of God. They would come in a particular way. In Psalm 32, 7 says, let us go to his dwelling place. Let us worship at his footstool. And Psalm 100, verses 4 and 5, enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and bless his name. For the Lord is good and his faithful love endures forever. His faithfulness through all generations. That's exciting to me. Man, I tell you what, you talk about coming into the place of worship, there must have been excitement when they came into that place. Kind of like what we do, right? Coming into the presence of God with celebration. I love when that first song, Mike, when we break out to that first song of worship, it is celebratory. I mean, it, it just gets us to the place where we're giving thanks and praise to God. Because I know when you come into this place, you've gone through a hectic week. You've gone through difficulties. You face challenges. But you realize this, you did not face them alone. Because he tabernacled with you all week. And you came into this place giving him praise and glory regardless of what you were going through. And that's the way you start off a worship service, with thanks and praise. All right, why did he do this? Why did God become a man? Well, not only to, to come and reside with us, but also to reveal his character. I want you to see the second thing here in verse 14. Number one, his glory. We observed his glory. John's already given us a, a hint of how we can see the glory of God when we understand about his presence and, and about who he is. He said, first of all, in his creation. In John chapter 1, verse 3, it told us that all things were created through him. Paul reminds us that in Romans chapter 1, that the, 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 the Godhead is revealed in creation. We can see the glory of God just by what's been revealed to us in creation. I mean, you, even scientists are, are, are dazzled by the, the vastness of our universe. And our God lives beyond that. It reveals his glory. Psalm 19.1 says, The heaven declares the glory of God, and the expansion proclaims the work of his hands. I want to tell you this, I do not believe in chance. I believe in the sovereignty of God. If you're here today and you're wondering why, well, I'm going to let you in on a secret. God. There are going to be people tonight who are wondering why they had gathered it there in East Providence, and it will be God. God drew me to himself through creation, through 
physical things, circumstances. God began to reveal himself to me as he was providentially working in my life. I didn't know him as Lord. I didn't know him as Savior. But I did know something about his glory in what he was doing in the created work around me. There was no chance going on. There was the sovereignty of God drawing me to himself. We also see it in light, John says. We see God's glory in light. Now that seems pretty obvious to us. When you see a bright light, you would, you would think of glory. And for me it is anyways. And it says in verse five, the light shines in darkness and yet darkness did not overcome it. God's glory is so amazing that no matter what evil is thrown against it, it can't handle it. It never overcomes it. And then finally in Revelation chapter 21, when it's all over and said and done with, and everything is restored as God intended it to be, there's going to be no need for a sun, no need for lamps, as Revelation 22 says. His glory will be enough. God with us, we have the privilege of knowing his glory so that his word would be a lamp unto our feet. His Holy Spirit would reveal our sins in our lives so that we might confess it and come clean. His glory shines in our lives so that we can know his will and his path and his purpose and his plan for us. Also the miracles. And like I said, in my opinion, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And then in John chapter two, Deshaun's life verse, verse 11. It tells us that Jesus did this, the first of his signs in, the, in Cana of Galilee. He revealed his glory, didn't he? When he changed water into wine. And in verse 40 it says, and Jesus said to her, didn't I tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? You want to see the glory of God? See it in his greatest miracle, that God became a man and dwelt among us, and also his holiness. I want you to see his holiness, too, in the fact that he revealed himself to us in his glory. In Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 through 3, in the, king of, in, the death, in the year of King Uzziah's death, I saw the Lord seated high and lofty throne, and the hem of his robe filled the temple, seraphim, were standing above him. With each had cover, had six wings, and with two they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they flew. And one cried out to the other, holy, holy, holy. His glory fills the whole earth. All right, we've seen his glory. We've seen, now I want you to see now his greatness. His greatness is the one and only Son from God. There is no one else like him. He is the only one. The unique one. In John 1.34, we have seen it testify that this is the Son of God. John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only unique, not duplicated, never seen before, his one and only. And in John chapter 5, 19 through 20, it says, Jesus replied, I tell you the truth, the son is not able to do anything on his own, but he only sees the father doing. For whatever the father does, the son likewise does these things. For the father loves the son and shows himself everything he does, and he will show him greater works than these, so that you will be amazed. So we see his glory, his greatness. Now I want you to see his grace. It says also not only was his glory, but also he was full of grace. Now there's two types of grace, and I listed them to you for you there. One is common grace. That means in Psalm 145, verse 9, that God's goodness and his compassion rests on all that he has made. God gives us graciousness to everyone and all that he has made. Matthew chapter 5, verse 45, he says he even sends the rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. And in Luke 6, 35, for his gracious, for he is gracious to the ungrateful and the evil. So there's a common grace, but there is, more importantly, a saving grace or a special grace. It is Titus chapter 2, verse 11, for the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all people. And that's what you see 
in the coming of Jesus as a man. The coming of God as a man. You see the saving grace of God. That's his grace to redeem us. But God proved his own love for us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He made us alive, Paul says in Ephesians, with Christ. Even though we were dead in in trespasses, you are saved by grace. For you are saved by grace through faith and not of yourselves. It is a gift of God. I hope you understand that grace. You did not earn it. You're not looking good enough. You're not wealthy enough. You're not even special enough. I'll tell you what, you're loved enough that God graciously died for you and me. And then lastly, it is his gospel. It's full of grace and truth because of the hope reserved for you in heaven. You already heard about this hope in the word of truth. John 14, 6, Jesus, I am the way and the truth and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. And Jesus prayed for all of us, sanctify them by truth. Your word is truth. As you have sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. I sanctify myself for them so that they also may be sanctified by the truth. All right, so he's in tabernacling with us. He resided with us. He also revealed his glory to us, his character, his nature. And then lastly, he came, as I hope you understand, to redeem his children. When he came into the world, he came in to redeem it. Now I want you to understand this. He never asked for permission. He never said to his creatures, do you mind if I show up and save you from your sins? You're you're in a bad situation and I think I can take care of this. Would you be willing to allow me to come into this world? So he never asked for permission. It tells us in verses 10 and 11, as Deshaun shared last week, he was in the world and the world was created through him, yet the world did not recognize him. They didn't invite him. They didn't even recognize him. They weren't expecting him to show up. And he came to his own people and they did not receive him. Now comes for you and me what you just heard there, receive him, I believe is the second greatest miracle of all that he's willing to come and live within us. God wants to live in you and me. Isn't that awesome? Think about that. That's got to be something to hoot and holler about. You ought to be excited about that, that God lives in me. Everything from the beginning of creation was a plan to prepare for the coming of his son so that he might tabernacle in you and me. Wow. But to all who receive him, he gave them the right to be children of God to those who believe in his name. He may have come into this world, as I just shared with you, without anyone's permission, but he's not going to force his way into your life. You and I have to receive him. You give him permission. What you say is this, no longer am I the Lord of my life, You are the Lord. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. All he's asking for now is this, permission. For you are saved by grace through faith, not of yourself, but as a gift of God. He enters by faith. He said, I am the gate in John 10. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will come in and go out and find pasture. Not only do we enter by faith, number two, we endure by faith. Hebrews 10, 36, for you need endurance so that after you have done God's will, you may receive what is promised. In order to keep going in this, to endure it, it has to be faith. It got you in, it's going to keep you going. Faith. I take God at his word. 
In John 14, 21, the one who has my commandments and keeps them is the one who loves me. And the one who loves me will be loved by my Father. I also will love him and will reveal myself to him. And John 14, 30, 23 says, Jesus said, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word. And my Father will love him and we will come to make our home. We will tabernacle with him. That's exciting to me. You know that as a Christian, you are the greatest, the second greatest miracle of all history. The God who created all things lives in you. Wow. And guess what? Not only do you enter by faith and endure by faith, you exit by faith. You have absolutely no control over your exit plan. Oh, you may have ideas. Go ahead and tell those to God. I think he always finds humor in that. How many of you want to go in your sleep? Yeah, good luck. I hope that works out for you. <laughs> well, I hope you do this. You trust God in the way you exit. He brought you in. He's allowed you endurance. And he's going to let you out. Romans 8.30, and those he predestined, he also called. And those he called, he justified. And those he justified, he will also glorify. Take you out of here. That's what salvation is. Salvation is justification, sanctification, and glorification. And it's all by faith, just trusting him. Colossians chapter 1, verse 2, give thanks to the Father who has enabled you to share in the saints' inheritance in the light. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23, now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely and may your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept sound and blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And I love how the NRV, as we conclude this morning, says this verse. The word became a human being. He made his home with us. We have seen his glory. It is the glory of the one and only son. He came from the father and he was full of grace and truth. And that same picture that we saw in the Old Testament was seen in Jesus. And now seen in you and me. And that his position is right at the center of our lives and his perfection is demonstrated through the way we live. And his presence is always with us. And his person, he's not a force. He wants a relationship with you and me. He's a person. And all he asks from us is this, that we take this wretched life and exchange it for his glorified life. He said, if you would do that and surrender to me as Lord, I would come and tabernacle in you and your life will never be the same. I invite you to stand. Would you respond to what God has said to you this morning? This is a time of invitation. It's a time for us uh, not to get our things ready to go home. It's a time for us to pray. You might already experience and enjoy the privilege of God living within you, but there may be somebody here this morning that needs to know that. Would you pray? And may the Holy Spirit move powerfully, drawing us to himself today. Would you respond to the good news of God's great salvation found in Jesus. You come this morning as we sing this hymn of invitation. Father, do your work. May we respond according to your nudging, what you are drawing us to, and that is to yourself. Lord, move us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.